what I'm going to say today is the truth based on science. I know that um, some of you may have different kind of ideas about it, which is fine, but I will test you based on what science says. Um, I don't really want to get into a lot of political discussions about vaccines or anything like that because it'll just tear us apart. So let's not do that. I will, I will give you my take on vaccines, and if you disagree with it, you can say I disagree, you can say why you disagree, but I don't really want to get into an argument with you, okay? I respect that you may or may not want to take your vaccine, and really that's all it should be. I'm not one of those people that basically say that if you don't take a vaccine, I don't want to talk to you. However, I might not want to hang out with you because you might make me sick. But um, there's a lot of turmoil in this country over all kinds of different things, including masks. I'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the reason why people wear masks, even though that might not be the reason that people think they wear masks. Okay, um, and so those will all come. Now we're going to talk today till about 20 minutes into the lab period, because the lab today is very short. So I'm going to take another 20 minutes and hopefully get through coronavirus. And then we come back next time and I'll talk about arboviruses and we'll talk about HIV and things like that. And then we'll be done. So the morning class has already voted to move the exam from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. Would you like to do the same? Yes, please. Yes, please. I need, I need, a, I need a motion. Okay, tram moves that we move into next to a week from Tuesday. Second? I second that. All in favor? Agreed. No, it has to be a hand. Can I raise your hand? Is that Tuesday the first? Yep. Okay, so let it be said, so let it be done. Okay? So therefore, we'll have a review next Thursday. So we'll finish Virology Tuesday. On um, Thursday next week, I'll start unit four. We'll have a review at 1.30. Like normal. Yeah. This micro test three is the group one we're doing in the group, same class? Group in class. In this room? Mm, probably. And then we get like huddled in the corners and stuff? Huddle in uh -huh. corners. Lots of whispering? A lot of whispering. <laughs> All right. Not whispering, just talking. Okay. You don't have to keep secrets. Mild amount of curses? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay. And then it will only cover mycology, parasitology, and virology. That's it. What? But there's Not a lot. Fungi? That's mycology. Oh, mycology, okay. And that's, a, that's groups, just a uh, closed book, just us using our brains coming up to get for the answers. Multiple yeah, choice. it can't be open book. I just can't right. go sure. with that. Multiple choice or small ones? I'm choice. probably going to make most of it objective, so there'll be multiple choice matching and some short answer. It's all fun. And you know, one of the short answers is going to be the malaria life cycle. Draw it. Explain it. Sure. <laughs> okay. The 37-step one or the... No, no. The, the small one. The small one. So listen, I understand that you all aren't going to be microbiologists because if you were taking a real micro class, you'd have to know all the life cycles. Okay? Good? Questions? Jin Jin, you good? Yeah. All right, let's go. So if we talk about viruses... They're way too small to be seen with the naked eye, and even with the types of microscopes that we have in the lab. Therefore, we can only see them through electron microscopy, right? And this is really, if you think about the entire history of science, this is a relatively new thing, right? 1940s, 1950s, we started to really be able to use electron microscopes. The electron microscopes now are beautiful. We can magnify things in some cases up to a million times that their, that their size is, right? So prior to that, right, um, if, we think about, if we think about viruses themselves, right, we knew for a long time, physicians knew for a long time that there was something that were making people sick that were smaller than the bacteria. But they didn't have the concept or the idea nor <coughs> the resources to be able to appreciate what those things were. So a lot of times they basically said that what was causing people to get sick was mal -aigre. Malagre is Latin for bad air. And so basically it was miasma, it was bad, bad air, but there was something in the environment that was making people sick. Right? Louis Pasteur was way beyond his, his time with his thought processes. 
And so what he said is that there is an infectious agent smaller than a bacterium that is causing illness. And he coined the term virus, right? So that term is still used today, right? Thanks to Lewis Pasteur, right? <coughs> Viruses are considered to be unfilterable, right? So tell me what is the nominal pore size of a filter that would hold back bacteria? Point two, Point two, two. two. See how much you know. <laughs> See how much you know. So a 0.22 micron filter is a hold back bacteria, but it's not going to hold back viruses that are nanometers in size. Now, it might hold back some of the viruses that are larger, but we don't care about those things because they're not, they're not dangerous to us at all. Okay? What's an example of a big one? Mimi virus, right? There's been one that has been, that has been identified and said, oh, Samantha, to be the size of E. coli. I don't believe it. <laughs> because I haven't seen it personally. But there's a paper supposed to be written and presented by the end of this year that I am going to be reading so that I can update my thought processes because once that becomes published in a peer-reviewed journal, then it's acceptable. But right now, you know, it's just kind of flutterings around scientific communities that I'm part of. Okay? Good? Sir? So if we think about this for just a minute, right, viruses can infect every single type of cell. However, viruses are host specific. If a virus infects E. coli, Isabella, it's only going to infect E. coli. It's not going to infect anything else. It's not going to infect Staph aureus. It's not going to infect Klebsiella. Only E. coli. Okay? Hence, if a virus infects your lung tissue, it's not going to infect your kidney. It's not going to infect your brain. It's only going to be attacking your lung cells. Why is that? Oh, I was just going to say they're cell-specific. Host-specific is oh, what we like yeah. to say. Because, for instance, rabies has a range of organisms it can infect, right? So it can infect dogs, and it can infect deer, and it can infect wolves, and, and not possible, um, um, coyotes, skunks, coons, and humans. So we say it has a range of, or, but it only affects the nerve tissue. So even if it's got a host of organisms that it infects, it only infects the nerve tissue. So tissue specific, I guess? Tissues, well, we like to say that it's host specific. How do you spell right? that? Host specific? Host, okay. H-O-S-T, host. Why is that, why can't it like, affect like multiple parts of it. That is a beautiful question. Here's the really cool quick answer. It's based on receptor sites. Okay? So the receptor sites that are on the surface of the cells that it infect is the only thing that the virus is going to recognize as being infected. Okay? Now think about the different mechanisms by which we've talked about for the organisms that we have studied already. Bacteria, the fungi, the parasites, metazone, protozoan, and now the viruses, right? About how they how they go about infecting things, right? They're all a little bit different, right? And so therefore, we are attacked on a daily basis. But our immune system is so in tune that a lot of times we don't get sick, right? The last time I got sick was the summer, and some person in my, in my major's micro class gave me COVID, right? I'm sticking to that story. That's the way it was, right? Um, because I, I had been at a scientific convention presenting some of, our, some of our work, but nobody there, it appeared, had COVID, and we were all masked up during the whole thing. Now, the mask is a little bit different, we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but the COVID was making the rounds in my class, right? So there'd be three people missing from that group, one missing from that group, and so it just went on and on and on. And I think one of those people gave me their cootie, and I got it. Now, I have been, quadrupled vaccinated for it. And so I didn't think I had, I didn't even know I had it. My wife came in one day and said, you look horrible. I'm like, I looked at the mirror and I'm like, oh shit, I look bad all the time today. <laughs> Must look bad all the time because this is a me, right? Mm -hmm. But then she came in, we swabbed, did this, and I was tested positive for COVID. That was Thursday. I counted the first time I had symptomology on Wednesday. Yeah, because you know I had to report. When do you? When did you get it? I'm like mm, Wednesday. Why did I say Wednesday, Samantha? Because I had to be back in the classroom on Monday, right? Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Friday. Well, good. That works. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 
I think about everything. Like, okay, did I really have symptoms on Wednesday? Mm. I felt tired. Okay, good. I, was, I had symptoms on Wednesday. <laughs> but when I showed up back to class, I was masked up for another five days. And my students are very, like, this. they go, oh, Provi, why are you wearing a mask? I said, because I care about you and I'm trying to protect you. Did you test positive for COVID? How do I say no to that? I'm like, yeah, I did. Okay. <laughs> but I think, I said, but then I, I thought it was, you know, she gave me her cootie and everybody laughed. But you know, it's just, you know, just for fun. Okay. So remember, viruses can only replicate if they're inside a cell because they take over the cell that they're infecting and they use that cell as a virus making factory. Isn't that cool? That's a virus what? Making factory. Good. Isn't that cool, Isabella? Here's a, here's a biologically active molecule, if you will, an entity that uses your own cells against you. Why are viruses not attacked by our immune system? Why are viruses not attacked by our immune system? Is it the, the envelope? I like the envelope idea, but go further than that. Yeah. Not antibodies yet. Because they, because they become part of our own cell, right? So why would we... Good hypothesis, thank you for playing. No. Who else wants to play? Anybody else want to play? Where are viruses most comfortable? Where are they most effective? Inside a cell. So if they're inside a cell, the immune system doesn't know they're there. They're inside of our cells. Isn't that cool? Is that what that means? Obligate intracellular parasites? That's what that means. They can only replicate if they're inside a cell. Good? You see how she picked up on that like that? That's the way I want you to think. That's a point. Huh? <laughs> so that could be a point. It's too early. In the, it's too early. <laughs> How many points have you earned already for exam three? Zero. None. Is that true? Tram, yeah. Tram, is that true? Yes. Okay, one point for everybody. Aren't there well, specific white blood cells that attack our own cells? Attack our own cells? Like they are, their job is to look for our own cells that have all, all of the white blood cells do that. Okay. So, but one of the white blood cells is most important. It's the T4 helper. Okay, yeah. The T4 helper it gets communicated by all other cells. There's something in here that doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. And so eventually the immune system will get smart and they'll figure out that there's a virus, right? And so when that happens, the some of these natural killers will walk around or hang out looking around. And when they see that the virus is inside, they'll just tag it, kill it. And they'll just go on, kill it, kill it, kill it. And then it communicates with the T4 helper, and the T4 helper sends a whole, a whole bunch of messages to all these other things that call cytokines, go over, and then all the, all the lymphocytes come in and take care of this. But that usually takes That's about two thinking, weeks, yeah. right? The last time that my wife and I got influenza <coughs> together was pre-pandemic about six years ago. Come on, now. she got it first, gave it to me. I said, "Cootie girl." So it lasted three weeks with her. It lasted two days with me. And what I told her was, "That's because my immune system is kick-ass, and yours isn't." But she told me, "Well, that just means you have to take care of me." I said, "By marriage vow." I am bound to take care of Would you like soup now or later? <laughs> Good. Let's go. All right, now, how do we know what these things look, Ms. Tram? How do we know? The temp. Oh, good. Electron microscopes, right? So we have micrographs of all these viruses, and therefore, people who specialize in artwork for biological processes can draw these images based on an electron microscope. So this is what this virus looks like. And you might think, probably you're just making this stuff up. But there is the electron micrograph. Look at it. Isn't it cool that a virus can look like this? It's beautiful, right? It, it does look like it's from outer space. And it's pretty interesting to think about. So here is a whole bunch of different characteristics that we use to 
define and to categorize viruses. Now, I don't need you to memorize this entire chart. So I want you to know these three right here. You see them right there? Most important, number one, nucleic acid type. We either say that viruses are DNA viruses or they're RNA viruses. Yes? Second thing, they're enveloped or they're naked. What does that mean, Christian? They're enveloped. Oh, Jin knows. Jin, tell me. Oh, uh, an envelope is a phospholipid bilayer. bilayer, and the naked ones don't have those. What do they have? Just a regular, uh, Just a regular, the regular protein cover. Yes. Good. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes, I'm, is that enough? So all viruses have a protein covering, and inside of that protein covering is a nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, right? Animal viruses, the ones that are really dangerous, have an envelope, and an envelope is a phospholipid bilayer, and a lot of times that envelope is constructed from the cells that they have infected. Okay? So when they leave, they take a little piece of that plasma membrane and it becomes the coat. Now, then they get specialized, right? Then they have certain spike proteins and other things in them because they go on to infect and cause problems. Okay? What? So they take a piece of the plasma membrane and what? And that becomes their envelope. Mm -hmm. Just yep. further masked by the immune system? Correct. So envelope? It wasn't envelope easier to kill or no? No. Well, okay, time. Yes. Um, they are so weak, alcohol will destroy them because they're so tiny. But they're also more dangerous to us. The most dangerous of all viruses to humans, or to animals, are those that are RNA viruses that are enveloped. Write that down. Those that are RNA viruses that are enveloped. Those are things like HIV, COVID, influenza, you could go on and on, um, rabies, you could go on and on and on and on about them, right? You said RNA envelope? Uh, RNA envelope. So they're easier to destroy, but um, They're more dangerous to more us, dangerous to right? Why? I don't understand. Because, um, let, me, let me explain from two parts. The first part is they're enveloped, and if they're enveloped, Eric, tell me if you don't want me to touch you. If I am an envelope virus, and that's a lung cell, I am coming and I am attracted chemotaxically to that lung cell. But the immune system's leaving me alone because I'm masked, I have an envelope, right? And so when I come in, because I'm constructed, Miss Samantha, of the same type of components that that plasma membrane is constructed, I can just simply use, right? Now, there are other mechanisms. COVID's got a really cool mechanism, right? Amy, make a receptor site. See, she's, she's got it down already. There's a receptor site. I'm COVID. Here is my spike protein. I come in here, and now when I'm attached here, the cell is tricked. Oh, there's something good coming. Open up. Pull it out. Pull it out. Oh. And now, Oh my God, it's a beautiful piece of biochemistry and biology. Sir? So the envelope one just fuses, it doesn't use the uh, receptor sites, or does it have both? They can do all kinds of things, right? So no virus is exactly alike. They all have different mechanisms, okay? So the en we were really worried. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So the envelope is what makes it dangerous because it can fuse more easily and the immune system cannot recognize it. That is correct. Also makes At it least more... early in the process. Eventually the immune system catches on. Yeah, but like it's more uh, easy to be wiped away by alcohol because of the envelope. And because the envelope is phospholipid, the alcohol can get it. And because it's so tiny, there's not much to get, right? And if it doesn't have an envelope, it doesn't work. The mechanism won't work if the envelope isn't there. Because the receptor site doesn't work. Right? Early on, during the early parts of COVID, many of us scientists were worried that people that were taking ACE inhibitors for high blood pressure were going to be more in tune to getting infection. Because if you're taking an ACE inhibitor, how do the cells respond? If, you're, if, you have ACE if you have ACE receptor sites and they're being blocked, ACE inhibited, inhibition, 
What is how? What does the cell do? Stop regulating. So what it does is it just puts more receptor sites on its surface, right? They're blocking those. Oh, you're not going to get away with that. I'm going to just make more, right? And we thought, oh my God, people who have high blood pressure and are taking ACE inhibitors are going to be really, really susceptible to to COVID. It didn't work out that way, but it was a great hypothesis, and we brought it up and we started talking about it. And people started looking into it, and we found out that that's not really going to be the case. What we were right? So many Why? things. Why didn't it work like that? We don't know. Huh. We don't know. We don't know everything, right? We only know what we know at this very moment. That doesn't mean we're not going to understand it in the future, right? But Samantha, other challenges are coming. And soon enough, COVID will not will be an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Like that chicken dust virus theory on. Like monkeypox. Right? How many people are even talking about monkeypox anymore? Nobody mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really got down. Monkeypox is still here, mm -hmm. but it's not really as bad as it was or what we thought it was gonna be. We're not talking about it no more. Right? We, we move on. That's the way we are as humans. Solve the problem. Let's go on. Oh, hell, there's another problem. Because there's always another problem. Yeah. Right? To me, this is the most beautiful of all sciences. Because it's always changing. Right? They're talking about action potentials and gradient potentials next door. Those things are the same every single time. But look at all the differences in what happens with the infectious agents and how the infectious agents affect us. To me, that's why I fell in love with this discipline. Right? And three careers and four degrees later, here I am still talking about the thing that I love the most. Yes, ma'am? So the virus is not a living thing. It needs a cell yep. to you know, reproduce. Yep. And it takes a little piece of the phospholipid bilayer uh -huh. and creates the envelope. For a little while. And produce and reproduce in different cells and take over the cell. But I probably should know this, but it's just now clicking. Like, so the viruses come from where? <laughs> like, how do they come about? Um, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. As long as there have been, as long as there's been life on this planet, there has been viruses on this planet. So how did that happen? There was a mixing of genes, and that's the way it happens now, right? So we'll talk about influenza, and we'll talk about COVID, and I'll give you my hypothesis of how the COVID virus came to be. That is the best ideas that I have based on what's been published. It involves a bat and a pangolin. You know what a pangolin is? It's a little, kind of like an anteater little dude, right? Yeah. An anteater? Looks like a little anteater. Ant but, so I will tell you that story, but am I 100% sure? No, I'll say this is my hypothesis, based on what I've read. And a lot of people have published this already, right? <laughs> but not enough, Amy, that we can all, as scientists, agree that's, that's it, right? There have only been, like, about, 20 publications. We need more before we can say, yeah, that's the way it happened. Okay? Yes. So are those not peer reviewed then? They are peer reviewed. <laughs> Interesting. But listen, just because something is one peer reviewed doesn't mean we're all going to jump on board, right? <laughs> Some of us, if it's our discipline and we know the people who published, we might jump on board pretty quickly. But somebody <coughs> down in Australia, might be looking at oh, Americans are full of, you know, I'm not gonna believe this till I see it and my, with my own eyes. And that, that's what conferences are for. That's, what the, that's why the nerds gather every once in a while, to have those exchange of ideas. That's how we foster research. I was just at a conference in July presenting some of my work, right? I, we had two poster sessions. I'm going to be presenting in July my research that I did for my dissertation. So, you know, all this stuff gets, gets published and presented and 
And the interesting thing about uh, science, at least when you come up with a new idea, is when you go and present, you get beat up because people are not going to agree with you. And you will get so much criticism from your peers that you just have to be able to sit there and say, OK, th and take notes, because you want to go back and try to answer those questions. Because you, you can't really figure out anything, all the things they're going to ask you. Right? And you have to go back and, and answer those things. Because if you have a major find, you should be able to answer those questions. And then you might get the Nobel Prize. Now, I probably won't get the Nobel Prize for the stuff I did, but somebody will get the Nobel Prize. The guy at UT who first conceptualized the spike protein and showed us the structure of the spike protein to me is a candidate for the Nobel Prize. Wow. Because he allowed the vaccines to be worked on ahead of time, and within a year's time, they had a vaccine. <coughs> you can look them up. That's really cool. I feel like they have an amazing science program. I've heard really cool things about them. Valencia, did you have a question? Oh, Lord. Okay. What's that? What's number three? Number three is morphology. Okay? Good? So here are all these things, but those are the top three. Those are the ones I want you to know, and in that order. If I ask you what's the most important characteristic, when you characterize the virus, it's going to be nucleic acid type, RNA, DNA. Right? If I say give me the top two, it's nucleic acid and whether it's enveloped or naked. Naked means it doesn't have an envelope. So remember, every, every virus has a protein covering and a nucleic acid. And the nucleic acid can be either, either RNA or DNA, but not both. Some of them, animal viruses, only animal viruses have an envelope. The envelope is around the capsid, around that protein covering, and it's mostly for infectivity. The, the capsid, the protein covering, is the protection of the nucleic acid. Okay? You said only animal viruses have an envelope? Because if you think about it, bacteria and plants and yeah. fungi all have cell walls. And we're technically animals, right? No, no, not technically. We are. Or we are. Yeah. <laughs> the capsid protects the what? The capsid protects the nucleic acid. Okay? You said every virus has what and what? A, a, a capsid and a nucleic acid. Okay? The capsid is interchangeable for protein cover. It is the protein cover. Okay? okay. All right, so if we look at this, here's, here's E. coli. E. coli is approximately 2 microns in length. Cercotacus pyogenes, if we look at it, right, it is uh, one micrometer in diameter. One the, well, of the smaller bacteria is a rickettsia. It's 0.33, mic it's 0.3 microns, right? Therefore, it can be removed by a 0.22 <coughs> micron, right? Mm -hmm. But now, if you look at some of the larger ones, here's the mini virus. It's about 450 nanometers in size, right? Here's herpes, right? 150 nanometers. Here is rabies, about 125. Here's HIV. HIV is about 110. Here's influenza, right, 100. Uh, some of these other guys, right, uh, the adenoviruses, the bacteriophage. If you think about them, right, they get down into the, like, yellow fever is 22 nanometers in size. Well, a molecule hemoglobin is approximately 15 nanometers in size, right? So the viruses, the, some of the bad viruses are not very much, are just a little bit larger than a hemoglobin. Now that's pretty cool to think about how something so small can cause so much trouble. And viruses only exist to infect and replicate, and that's all they do. The disease that is the product of the infection and the replication is just ancillary to them. They don't care. Their job is to infect and replicate. The fact that somebody gets COVID or somebody gets rabies, no. their job is to infect and replicate. Good. Yes, ma'am. When it comes to the sizes, do you want us to know all the sizes? No, I do not. That no, so not at all. I'm showing you this for position. I want you to be able to understand 
the relative size of a virus to a bacteria. Okay? Because everything else that's infectious is bigger than a bacterial. So now we're looking at things that are smaller. Okay? So we cannot see viruses with the naked eye, nor with any kind of scope that we have here. We have to use an electron microscope. In order to do that, we have to use some techniques. We can use a negative type of technique, or we can use a sputter coat type of technique. And when we sputter coat, we sputter coat the tissues that we're looking at with colloidal silver or gold. And therefore, that metal doesn't react with the electron beam. Because if you have anything organic that, that comes in contact with the electron beam, the, the instrument, the, the microscope is going to be hurt. It's going to be damaged. Okay? And they're pretty expensive to put back together. When we sputter coat, we kill everything we sputter coat. Are you saying spider or sputter? Sputter. S P U T T E R. That's the colloidal silver gold. Sputter coat. I mean, you, do you think I'm going to have a question on there about sputter coating? No, but if I understand, like, some stuff around the way from the clinic, there won't be a question about sputter coat, I promise. Here, if we think about this, this is the way bacteriophage T4R works, and this is really a virus much like influenza would work, right? And so I talked about a capsid and I talked about an envelope. Tell me, Amy, what is the purpose of a capsid? She, she always like tells a story with her hands before she talks. It's protecting, it's protecting the nucleic acid. Tell me, Kay, what's the purpose of an envelope? Infectability. Infectability. Okay. Remember the little skit I did with Eric? Oh, you were so here, here is a virus. That is the capsid, and inside of the capsid is the nucleic acid. Yes. Here is the same virus that has a capsid and the nucleic acid, but now it has an envelope. I am not saying that a virus can exist naked and with an envelope in the same species. That's not what I'm saying. This is just a representation so that you can see the difference between the capsid and the envelope. Yes? So when they have the envelope, they're trying to protect just the RNA if they don't have? No. The purpose of the envelope is in for infectivity, for be a, a better organism to <coughs> infect cells. Mm -hmm. Okay? So when, when does that come in play? Because like, you said that it only can only be DNA or RNA. Yep, yep. So there are DNA envelope viruses and there are RNA envelope viruses. But the reason that the RNA envelope viruses are more dangerous is because the envelope allows it to infect, but the RNA, because it's an RNA virus, it mutates a lot more often. Mm -hmm. So we're never going to catch up with it. Okay? How many times has COVID 19 mutated? Mm -hmm. Thousands. Oh, way more. Four times that are important, right? Because it changed the structure and made it different. Over 40,000 times. Mm. I always um, thought about that, like, whenever we were so, like, rushed, of course, to get, like, a vaccine, weren't, like, it was like, what was the point? Because it's going to mutate. Like, yes to, like, save people, but it's going to mutate. So that's the first strain of the va vaccine is not going to be as, you know, like, that's, like, common. <laughs> I, I see you. I see you. <laughs> I'm going to answer because I don't want you to talk, okay? I'm going to answer, and then if you have something you want to say, you can talk. Fair enough? So the reason we got vaccines is because the vaccine was pertinent to the strain that was current. And that was going to protect a lot of people. And so if we give people the vaccine, their immune system can be, if you will, initiated, and we will have the antibodies against the particular virus. And therefore, when you get a vaccine, that does not mean you're not going to come down with the virus or whatever, infection. It just means that if you come down with the infection, the infection is going to be less severe and it's going to be less, right? It's going to be less time. It's going to be truncated in the amount of time it affects you. 
So the reason we got the vaccine was to protect the population. Now, 50% of the population does not believe that vaccines are important, and some percentage of that group think that they're never gonna get a vaccine because in the vaccine there are things in it that could hurt them or things in it that people could track them, right? Um, both not true. But we still sit at, um, at a population in the United States that's still segregated based on whether or not they believe vaccines are important or not. And it's unfortunately usually down political lines. Yes. So you're saying, like, whenever you get, like, well, her question, she said, you know, you're already um, developing. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So you keep saying when you have an envelope virus, it makes it kind of like incognito for a little while, you know. And so the theory behind the vaccine is that it's in your system and you're starting to go through that incognito phase already and get rid of that. Yeah. So if you do come in contact with a full-blown virus, your body is already going to recognize and protect. Against what? Against the virus. But what part of the virus? The RNA. Spike protein. They identify it and they're going to make, we can make the antibody to well, they, they, they generated bits and pieces of spike protein. They put it in your body. That the body says, what is this crap? And says, and then it identifies it, and it is unable to replicate. But then it generates the antibodies. So if you are exposed to it in the future, then you've already got these memory antibodies going. Oh, we know this crap. And then you, you, you've got to jump on stomping. Them. I couldn't have said it more elegantly. So <laughs> <laughs> spike protein is what you did with this, or that's a receptor? That's a receptor. Same thing. The what, thing. What you put in the hit thing. Hit me with the receptor. Okay. <laughs> that's the receptor. This is the spike protein. So the vaccine was against this protein. And how did we get that knowledge? The guy from UT. The guy from UT, yeah. right? So, and so the guy from UT said, this is what it looks like. And then, so say what you will about the Chinese, right? The Chinese never want to share information with me, or with anybody. But when, they, when, the, when it first hit, one of those Chinese, one of those scientists let the genome of the spike protein out. Just, I thought it was the entire genome. It was just uh, the of, of, the, of, the, of the virus, yeah. right? But the UT guy said, oh, thank you. And he compared that to what he had and said, I don't know. So then he said, I made a 3D model of the spike protein. Yeah. And already Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech were already in clinical trials already. And when they found out that they had the right protein, they just amped up their production of the vaccine. So they were in clinical trials and those companies were already making the vaccine. They hedged their bets. They hedged their bets because they knew the science and they knew that they had the right protein. Therefore, they were gonna make the vaccine ahead of time. And when the FDA finally said, okay, they were just gonna release the vaccine all at once. And people took that as, oh no, there's no way we could have had the vaccine. It usually takes 10 years to do that. That's because our research is slow. But because we've been working on the coronavirus since the first outbreak, we had all this knowledge. And because this guy from UT has been doing his work, and because the Chinese helped us, we released the vaccine in record time. Were they already working that because of SARS-1? Correct. Okay. Isn't that cool? Yeah. We saved millions of lives because of the vaccine. Because some people were doing science. Did China already have all their own vaccines and stuff? Right. They were making their own, and they have their own, mm -hmm. but they don't sell it to anybody. They just use it for themselves. Why? Because that's the way they are. It's called nationalism, right? They didn't, they didn't, they took a while to get their vaccine out too. Yeah, we had ours out first. Then they got theirs. And when they, when they found out they had to weigh too much, then they started selling it. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't sell it to the US, right? Now think about it, there's only, there's another one, but there's only two major players in the vaccine market for COVID, 
Moderna and Pfizer Beyond. I'm a J&J &J boy, but that vaccine was awful. Sloan English has AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca. That one I think is being pulled. Yeah, the Indians have them, the Chinese have them too, right? The the There's so I I have all those on the slides. I think I'll show you. They were dumping it all over second and third world countries, and they weren't working all that great. Yeah. The the ones that work really beautifully are those that the Germans and Americans got together and did. Germans. Hey Jen. <laughs> Do the spike proteins um like. Are they the same across all the um, coronaviruses? Mm, they're a little bit different. But there's enough similarities to them that uh, uh, the epitopes work for us. An epitope, hold your fist up, an epitope are all the curvatures in the protein. And so even if our immune system only makes and attacks one epitope, yeah. if it attacks any part of that spike protein, it's still effective. Okay? That makes sense. Good. Questions? I think I said it wrong, actually. I think the way that Moderna worked, it actually puts it, does it have our own cells made from just the spike proteins and drift them out of the cell? No, the way that the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech work is they use messenger RNA. The messenger RNA works with our ribosomes, and we, our bodies, produce. Yes our own spike proteins, yes. but still, the immune system says, what the hell is this? You, yeah. you, that part you got correct. Right, right. So, this doesn't belong here, let's make antibodies against it, and then now you're protected against COVID. It's even cooler than just dumping spike proteins. It's way cool. The way that Pfizer and BioNTech, I gotta give BioNTech some, some credit here, because they did a lot of work early on. Pfizer was just a money house behind them. But, um, the way Pfizer, BioNTech, and the Moderna vaccines work is the wave of the future. That's the way all vaccines are going to be made. And it's better because they get produced a lot quicker, and you get, and and there's no way you can come down with the infection, yeah, because it's just a spike protein or it's just something, right? Yeah. Hmm. that you hear these kinds of stories, yeah. right? Because I don't have that kind of story. Because I wouldn't put up with that shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, if somebody came in and, and wanted a vaccine and said, you know, I said I don't have any more, and they start yelling at me, I'm like, I don't know who the hell you think you are, but you get, get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm about to go down on you. I'm about to whoop you. <laughs> My mom works at ARC in Iowa, and they had a, um, a threat on the office that they had to shut down. She actually, they, they were there until like 12 a.m. because somebody said they were going to come shoot, like have a group of people come shoot up the office because they have the vaccine. And you know, no matter what my opinion is on it, that's not right. Like, like I have my own reasons why I didn't get it, but like, I don't believe like hate should be can I appreciate the fact that you have the courage to say I didn't get it? I, I like conversation. I yeah. don't like like arguments yeah. about stuff, but I like conversation. And I, I'm totally open with how I, it's great. It's great vaccine, So, but. Look, I made vaccines for a long time. I know how they work. I'm a big proponent for vaccines. 
She doesn't like them? No, I do. But, well, uh, I'm just, she I'm didn't trying, get that. I've been trying to have a baby. Okay, fine. So, <laughs> so she didn't get it. That doesn't mean that I like her any less or more. But yeah, although I, I do really love your daughter. <laughs> little Miss she Attitude. Like she wore her beautiful boots and was showing them off. And when I called on her, she wouldn't even look at me. <laughs> and when she walked, she was so she was full of attitude. Did you see her? <laughs> 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 She's gonna be an absolute beautiful child, a beautiful young lady, and all the boys are gonna be. You're gonna need two brooms when she gets old enough. One to beat her, and one to beat the guy who's, who's coming over to visit. Yeah. Okay. So again, we talked about the envelope, and we talked about the capsid, right? I need you to know what the functions of those things are. It's gonna be on the exam. It's going to be prominent on the exam. Okay? All right. So, again, just little images about, you know, envelope versus naked. So, the naked ones, they don't have a way to fuse tram. So, what they do is they have, pit, they have points and they have spikes and all kinds of different ways to get into the cell. Okay? So, remember, Mother Nature is creative and she is an assassin. Right? And so if we think about this, you know, there's all kinds of things going on in, in nature right now, right? Mother Nature is cooking up another big infectious agent for us right now. It's just a matter of time before they show up. Again. All right, so um, again, thinking about the most important of all the traits, of all the characteristics of viruses, or what type of nucleic acid is. I feel like Amy, I'm talking with my hands now. I got this talking with my hands, right? So uh, is, is it a DNA or an RNA virus, right? And so I want you to appreciate these next two slides. These next few slides talk about the, the clinically relevant viruses that are DNA and RNA, right? So if we look at DNA, we look at envelope and non-envelope, you can see here we have the pox viridi, Right, so that's monkey pox, chicken pox, cow pox, those kind of things. We have the herpes viridi, right? And so that's gonna be herpes simplex one, simplex two, right? Those that are non-envelope are things like adenovirus, common cold, uh, papaviridi, right? So ladies, why do you get pap smears ever so often? Do you check to cell group? Check for cell growth. Like check for abnormal cells. Abnormal cells, yeah. right? Yeah. We call those dysplastic cells, right? Because all viruses, when they infect cells, they change them. And so if they look abnormal, then we call those dysplastic. If we find dysplastic cells as part of that routine checkup, then we might ask you to come back in six months because we're going to be sure that it clears. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't clear, then we might want to do some other type of intervention. What exactly right. are, are you, like, concerned about? Cancer. cancer? Human papillomavirus <laughs> can cause cancer. It's a precursor for it. And by the way, Gardasil is another vaccine that I highly, highly doubt. Is that the, um, the series? Uh -huh. Highly tout or highly doubt? No, tout. Tout. Mm -hmm. tout. I don't agree with it. The only vaccine I've ever doubted is the one that was for Staphylococcus aureus, and I'll tell you right now, do not take it if it ever comes back on the market. They pulled it off because it was it didn't work. And I also do not like the nasal influenza virus. Don't like it. So don't take that one, and don't give it to your kids. The reason they are marketing is because kids don't like to take injections. Tell them it only hurts for a minute and give them a lollipop afterwards. Okay but have them get the injection. Do not allow them to give the nasal influenza. It sucks. I'm telling you the truth, right? Like how long do you give something before you make that sort of I look at I look at it? data. I look at data all the time. And when they offered, when they <laughs> offered me the nasal influenza vaccine, I looked them in the face and I said, no. I said, why not? I said, because I like shots. Give it to me. <laughs> yeah. But I went back home and I looked at the data. The data is, is, is conclusive that it's not that great. Is that because, like, if you take it, like, um, an injection? Yeah, it goes straight to, like, your 
Well, it'll stay there for a little while because a lot of times it's, so there's two way vaccines are made. There's an aqueous one that's made in phenol and water. And that one doesn't hurt. And there's one that's put in a little bit of glycerol. And that one stings when it goes in. No, no. But it's better because its stuff stays localized quicker. And you want it localized so the immune system can get to it. Okay? Yes, Audience, I thought I saw a hand up there. Okay? So, here are the RNA viruses. So, it gets all crazy with the RNA ones, right? Oh, yeah. So, here you see envelope and non envelope, and then here you see double stranded genome, single stranded. So, here you have the orthomix virity, the bunny virity, the arena virity, the pox, I mean, so the paramix virity, the rhabdo virity, that's rabies. Uh, the filial virity, that is. All of the hemorrhagic fevers, including including um, Ebola, right? And then here you have the coronaviridae, right? The coronaviridae have been around a long time. There's already been three pandemics associated with the coronaviridae, right? You had SARS-1, you had MERS, which was Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, and we typically saw that in the Middle East, and then it moved <coughs> up into the other continents. But we had very little of it here, right? And then we had SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, COVID okay? And then you come over here. Here's a special little guy right here, right? And that's the retroviridae. Those are the retroviruses. And in that group, you have <coughs> HIV, um, feline immunodeficiency <laughs> virus, feline leukemia virus, and human T lymphoma virus, right? And so, those all work with reverse transcriptase. Okay? Good? But there's, there's still, they're still not as dangerous as the... These are, these are, these are all pretty dangerous if they're enveloped. And the ones that I went through are all enveloped. But the retroviruses are not enveloped? You no, know they are. They're under the enveloped ones. You see them? Oh, okay. I'm seeing whatever that is on the far right. Non-envelope, but then these are just these three groups. Here. What's that other R over there? That's what I was looking This one here? Yeah. Real virus. Oh, I thought that's what Real we virus. About. Okay. So, the virologists are very, let's see, what's the word I want to call it? Egotistical. Okay. That's, that's probably a really good word for them. So, in 2000, I went to a nerd conference. I was a young, fledgling microbiologist. I went to a nerd conference, and I found out that the that the virologists were all meeting. They're having this big conclave where they were going to talk about the nomenclature of the viruses. I got, I got to go with that. So I showed up. I presented my credentials. Yeah. My credentials are pretty good, right? Yeah. And the lady looked at me and said, you're not a virologist. I'm like, So I walked away. I said, how am I going to get in? And then I saw my friend from Houston who's a badass virologist. And I said, Mary, can I just hang out with you? She goes, they won't let you in. I'm like, yeah. I said, they're a bunch of So I just walked in with her. And <laughs> then she was so well known. Oh, Dr. Vaughn, how are you? You know, they let her up. She didn't even sign in. She just walked in, right? And I was just like, okay. <laughs> but I sat down and listened to those bicker. They bickered all the time. And, and the big boys were there. Dr. Robert Gallo was there. She was your uncle. Yeah, she was <laughs> next to uh, Dr. Robert Gallo is there, right? The guy who gets the credit for finding HIV, even though he didn't, right? And uh, they were all bickering. After about three hours of bickering, they finally decided, somebody made a motion, they said they were going to have three orders, 63 families, all Indian and Verity. I don't know if you heard me when I was talking about the viruses. I call them, uh, um, I call them things like herpes Verity, right? I was using the family name. And then 263 general, all Indian virus, right? And they all agreed to this. And they all were all, yay, they were clapping for each other. And then I'm like, oh, wow, well, OK. And then they all went back to the research institutions. And guess what they did? Change it. Whatever the hell they want. <laughs> because that's just the way the virologists are. So my friend, another friend from University of Houston, who's now retired, found a novel virus. And he loved his daughter so much. Guess what he named? The virus. It's the Sasha virus. True story. And he came to visit me in my class, and when he, because Sasha was my student, and when he came in, I saw him and we said hello, and then I said, You want to talk? And he goes, Oh, yeah. 
So I just sat down and let them talk. And just talked about research and all kinds of things. That was a treat for the students, too. and a treat for me, too. I was like, ah, taking notes on the way. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. Right. So, so not have to no, absolutely not. No. So here, the only viruses you're going to have to know by genus and species are the ones we talk about, okay? Which is coming up. But just just look for a minute about the. Remember, I told you what was the most dangerous virus for us? Envelope RNA. Our envelope RNA. So let's look at the DNA ones that are clinically relevant and important, right? Mm -hmm. Smallpox, cowpox, fever, blisters, cold sores, um, general warts, chickenpox, shingles, right? Here's the viruses, here's what they cause, right? Adenovirus, right? Um, and then, you know, infect uh, everything you know, infect you also, right? But now let's go down to the other, to the R okay. oh, no, big list. So polio, polio hand, foot, and mouth disease, short-term hepatitis, the common cold. Now there are several different viruses that cause the common cold, right? Um, then you get your viral, your viral diarrhea, Norwalk. This is dysentery, viral dysentery. Eastern, Western, yellow, St. Louis. Those are all encephalitis, right? Then you have, then you have yellow fever, St. Louis, rubella, dengue fever, West Nile virus. There he is, again. And then you go into the respiratory distress. And now you get into the hemorrhagic fevers, rift gyrophilia, Crimean Congo, Ebola. Then you get into some of the gastrointestinal, right? Then you come in here to mumps, measles, the common cold again, right? Then you get into HIV, Lhasa, and there's the coronavirus. The coronavirus, when it first came to be, when it first started affecting humans, it caused a gastrointestinal problem, it caused enteritis. And somehow or another, then it started to cause respiratory illnesses. Right? Isn't that cool? Right? Yes, I'm Jen. So I'm just kind of trying to understand. So I know that if we have a virus, we'll always kind of carry the virus in us, right? Well, I mean, at least like a little piece, right? Oh, are, are you mean our cells? Yes. If we get infected with the virus, our, our, cell, right? our, our cells will always have a little bit of foreign viral DNA in it. So per se with hand, mouth, foot mouth disease, the kiddos actually got it. So, what does that mean? Did they did they convalesce okay? Did they get better okay? Yeah, yeah. They were the, the, nothing, but, that's nothing wrong. But so they're technically carrying that. Virus. Yeah, but that's not going to affect them ever. Ever again? again? Is it just a one-time thing? If they if they if they get it again, it's going to be a, another infection from another okay. from another source. But there are some lysogenic viruses, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. What do you mean it's from another infection from another source? So I, I get it I get it from your son, uh -huh. then I convalesce, I get better, uh -huh. and then Amy gives it to me. Well, a second time. But it's still sources. the same components of the everything? But the second time I get it, since I've already had it, it's gonna be less severe and it's gonna be truncated in the amount of time I have to deal with it. Truncated just means like short. Yep. And then the other ones are the ones that like dormant and we're going to talk about okay. that in a minute. Okay? Yep. Hantavirus? Hantavirus, yep. It, it, it belongs in this group here also. And Hantavirus in the 19... Late 80s, early 90s was a big deal for a while. When I first moved into my place in Oak Hill, there was a, there was a building in the back of the property that I wanted to turn into a workshop. But there's, there was so many rats in it, I had to get rid of all the rats. And then there was a lot of poo in there. So I had to go in there and clean all the poo out. But of course, I had to wear a respirator because I was afraid of hantavirus. And so I wore a respirator, I cleaned it all up. And then my wife said, no. And we, we tore it down and built another place on top of it. Chikungunya, Zika? Chikungunya and Zika are in this group also, right? So I, I like the fact that you know chikungunya. Oh, by the way, it's such a fun word to say, chikungunya, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, those are all here too. I, you, could put, you couldn't put every single virus in there. So let's talk about the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. So what is going on here, Jin Jin? Tell me what you see. It appears like a virus is making its way to a whole cell 
pass it into the cell and initially reproduces. And then, makes and, then, and then what's happened? And then, um, well, I thought it was like it was going to damage the cell and that cell bursts and releases like well, all that's the Okay, but in this case, it's not what's going on here. This is a different mechanism. It's budding. You see it? Yes. So here, so you, you said it right, virus is infecting the cell, it's attaching to specific receptor sites on the surface of the cell. This is a eukaryotic cell, there's a nucleus, right? It comes in, it uncoats, and then the RNA, it's an RNA virus, goes in and it directs the cell through the ribosomes to make a whole bunch of pieces of virus. And then it has the recipe said, okay, now put it all together again. And the cell becomes a virus making factory. So what's going on in the cell is ancillary to it's now its major function is to make more viruses. So all these things come together, they form viral particles, and when the virus is ready to leave, when it leaves, it takes a piece of the plasma membrane, and that plasma membrane becomes yeah. a mark. Isn't that cool? So the cell basically synthesizes what's inside the virus. Therefore, when you get exposed to influenza, how long does it take you to get the symptoms of influenza? Three or four days. No, it's less than that. It's usually two, two days. And you start, to, you might not feel it, but your you nose know, starts running a little bit. You're like, oh, okay, I have allergies. And then the next day you feel bad. Right. Mm -hmm. And then depending on who you are and what your immune system does and what your physiology is, with influenza, it can be, you know, like me, it's usually a two or three day event with my wife, it takes forever. I, I tell her she, you know, she's <coughs> not very strong immunologically. Right. I, I know all the viruses gonna work differently, right? They're all getting a different uh -huh. code. But does it essentially just have some sort of code where it just says, keep making this? Keep making this! It just inexhaustible, just keep making, keep making, keep making, keep making until the cell, like, can't function anymore? And it dies because it hasn't been making its own proteins yes. or anything else. Guys. So it locks up the ribosomes for its own factory to so turn it out. Okay. Then mm -hmm. all of them function like that? Or does some of them be like that? Oh, there's, there's, th there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of different mechanisms. But this is a very classical example. I'm gonna even use a less complicated one to talk about, right? And so we're going there now. So we're what gonna, dies, the little factory or the cell? Point one more time. What dies, the little, art, the little the, the cell, the, the, cell, cell the cell is the factory. Okay. Good. All right. So this is the bacteriophage. A bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria only, and it really infects a specific bacteria. So if we have a bacteriophage against E. coli, it's only going to affect E. coli, not Staph aureus, not Enterobacter, not Klebsiella, none of those, just E. coli. If you look here, it's got a capsid, and inside the capsid's a DNA. It's got a neck, it's got a tail sheet. The tail sheet acts like a syringe. It injects the DNA into the cell. It's got these tail fibers. The tail fibers really attach themselves to the receptor sites on the surface of the cell, okay? And then it has these pins, and the pins is the way that it basically makes the cell wall weaker, right? So here are the different stages of the lytic cycle. And no matter what virus you are talking about, they are all going to have attachments. Sometimes it's called absorption. They're all going to penetrate. They're all going to put viral components together. They're all going to assemble those viral components. The, the viruses will mature. And then you'll have release of the infectious viruses. OK? Good. So let's talk about the lytic cycle, not drawn to scale. <coughs> Right, so here you can see is the bacterium, here's the bacteriophage, it's attached to specific receptor sites on the surface. It will only infect that bacterium. It only recognizes that specific bacterium as being infectable, nothing else. Good? Are you with me? Samantha, so, um, you're making faces at me. I just like got distracted. Ask the question. Because I have an answer. 
I drank way too much coffee today. <laughs> I don't know if you know this. It only affects specific receptors. Okay. So, remember, viruses are host-specific. Okay? So then you have penetration. Now what happens is the virus injects its nucleic acid into the cell. And the, and the nucleic acid becomes transposonic. What does that mean, Maria? It becomes transposonic. The jumping genes? Huh? The jumping genes? It becomes part of the gene. It becomes part of the DNA. Yeah. yeah the gene okay. mm -hmm. So now it takes over the cell. And it basically says, I want you all to make a whole bunch of viral pieces. Here's a recipe. Go. And the cell starts making all these pieces of viruses, right? And so that recipe to put them together is in that code of nucleic acid. So now all those things get put together. You have the assembly, they're all getting put together. Eventually what happens is you have the maturation of, and this is showing four, but there can be thousands of them in there, right? And so what happens is when these viruses mature, they release a little bit of enzyme called lysozyme. And the lysozyme makes the cell walls, or the cells, if you will, weaker, right? And at some point, the cell just breaks apart and you have the release of all these new viruses and all these new viruses can go on to infect other cells. But the cell has to be the exact one that they, are, that they only recognize, okay? Questions? It would be a European person who would tell me that. Yes. That's what would be a question that I would pose to you. And since viruses are host specific, mm -hmm. if we have an infection of a bacterium and it's in our, I don't know, it's in our blood, we can put bacteriophages in there against that particular bacterium and it'll go in there and kill them. But it won't hurt anything else because viruses are host specific. Host -specific. So the good thing about that is, is that the bacteriophages are not enveloped, right? And so once all the bacteria have been destroyed, now the immune system's gonna find this thing and say, what the hell are you? And it's gonna get rid of it. So now there's no remnants at all of you either having an infection or we putting in the phage to destroy the infection. That particular idea is known as phage therapy. And it's being used widely in some parts of Europe right now. Because the Europeans are a lot more um, willing to take a risk than we are as a practice. I feel like it's not that big of a risk to take. It's no risk yeah. at all. American. But we're just, that's just the way we are. Yeah. So there was a very famous movie made on this idea. Tell me. Oh, Mega Man. No, Mega Man. I, 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 I am legend. Oh, that's not Mega Man. I am legend. Remember, the scientists had an idea to destroy cancer, and they were using phage therapy to deliver a payload. And once that infected the, the cancer, it basically said cancer died. And then somehow there was a mutation, and we have zombies, right? Yeah. That's never going to happen. But there could be a mutation that might affect us negatively. So we have to be careful. But if we use a bacteriophage to destroy bacteria, it doesn't make a difference what mutation occurs because that, that particular bacteriophage is never gonna target our cells. When you use a virus that can target our cells, then it becomes a little more complicated. except that it's only going to target one cell. So if you have a bunch of lactobacillus in your microbiome as part of your innate immune system in your gut, and this thing's attacking E. coli, it's never going to attack lactobacillus. So that was out. <laughs> Give me another one. Yeah. That little thing. That little thing. Same thing, the bacteriophage, yeah. that they suck out of that person's belly button in the matrix. 
remember that thing that they like suck out of there? I like, don't remember that. And it looks just like that. I was like, I know that from somewhere. And I swear, <laughs> pull it up. It's okay. Crazy. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to check but it, it out. Literally, it's big. It's, it's like it's big and it crawls around. It was probably the <laughs> nanobot though. It was it probably had a tail. It had a tail yeah. and it looked like that. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. It was probably a, a nanobot that they were doing, but. They, 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 like probably, they probably they probably got the inspiration from the bacterial fog. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So if the bacterial fog is like unenveloped, unavelo like why isn't it killed by the immune system it before will it be. affects? It will be. It will. But hopefully, so the, hey guys, listen up. The one thing about viruses is if they're inside a cell, they're going to be protected against the immune system, right? So, oh, <laughs> so right away, but that's why, okay? Yeah, so that's probably, a, that, yeah. It's a tracking device, yeah. but it's, yeah. they got inspired by the bacterium, I think. All right, so here is the lytic cycle. Right now it's calling a catchment absorption. You can see that it can be called that. Then you have penetration, then you have the replication of components. Components come together, assemble the virus. The virus is mature. And now it's showing a little hole in the cell. It didn't work that way. Cell breaks. Okay. Some, some artist got all created. You know, hole. It's like a volcano. <laughs> here is, here is an electron micrograph showing the bacteriophages attached to the cell wall. That's pretty This accurate. is an artist's rendition of that process. Now, there can be thousands of the bacteriophages attached to a single cell. And the really cool thing about this is when one virus makes penetration, there's a signal that goes off. Now we always thought there's no signaling in lesser organisms, lesser things. But here there's a signal goes off and all the viruses release. This is in penetration. Okay. okay. So you're saying when one of them penetrates, it sends out signals to the other ones. I got in. Uh, yeah. And the other one's gone. Oh, I did. missed my chance. Yeah, I got it. And they, are, they release. Oh, wow. Isn't that cool? Right. So we don't do it. We don't play with viruses in this course because you all, as healthcare professionals, are mostly going to be dealing with bacteria, right? So we don't really play with viruses. When I teach, when I teach the majors course. We do a phage assay. This is a plate that's growing a bunch of viruses. There is a lot of growth, there's bacteria growing on the surface, but each of those little dots is where an infection of a virus has started. Mm. So if we can count all those little dots, we know how many viruses were in a population. And we can do this with any type of virus, not just bacteria. The bacteria are the easy ones to play with, right? Because it doesn't take very much to get them going. Yes, Whenever you say that um, once one strikes in penetration and the other ones release, are the other ones like release, like they give up like trying to penetrate, or is that what you mean? They go penetrate other cells. Oh, okay. okay. Kind of like when a, I guess the A sperm hits an ovum. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Same thing. But, so but the difference there is those sperm action. ain't got a chance now, right? They're, they're yeah. just going to degrade where the viruses can find another cell. Because the viruses are alive, right? The the sperm have their own little con they have they have everything that keeps them alive. Yeah. So I assume they're modal. Mm, they they are mostly involved in getting around by the fluid matrices that they're in. Like body fluids. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. You Streaming of the, of the matrix. A solid agar on the right. Though. Solid agar. Mm -hmm. Growing on the surface. They can move in that. They're not moving. They're not moving. So every one of those little dots is where a virus landed, and they're infecting the cells. The cells, I don't know if you can appreciate this, but the cells are kind of growing on the surface of the agar. And where those clearings are, that means where they kill the cells off. That's, each of those things are called a plaque, right? And they represent one virus. It's a PFU, a plaque forming unit. Like we have a CFU, a colony forming unit. 
we have a PFU, and that's one virus. So the plaque, so when the virus was to kill the bacteria? Correct. Good. So again, some electron micrographs of the bacterial phage, so we know what it looks like because we have empirical evidence this is what it looks like. So we just talked about the lytic cycle. There's another part that some viruses have that's called the lysogenic cycle. In the lysogenic cycle, what happens is the virus infects the cell, the nucleic acid is introduced into the cell, the, the nucleic acid becomes transposonic. What does that mean? It becomes part of the gene or the code or the DNA or whatever, and then it goes dormant. It goes dormant, but every single cell that's produced from that particular infected cell is going to have that prophage, that little piece of nucleic acid now. So every single cell after that is going to have that. And at some point in your life, just when you are down and hurting, you're stressed out, and that can be things like Pro-V gave me too much work, it can be I got sunburned, I'm pregnant, it could be all kinds of stresses that happen. The virus says, it's a good time to cause problems because the body's stressed out, let's show what we can do. And then you have an eruption. Herpes works this way, chicken pot shingles work this way, right? Those are the two big ones. All wart processes, all warts are from a viral process. Okay? Is that what it's called? Warts. Warts. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I know you said it like three times, I'm sorry. Uh, but transposonic means it becomes part of the actual DNA. Chromosome. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, at which step after penetration that this Yes, that is correct. Part? Mm -hmm. So Samantha. When, you were, when your baby is about to be born, when your baby is born, its DNA is going to be pure. But after that, it won't be. Because every time it comes out with a viral infection, little bits of DNA and RNA are going to be left behind in the baby's cells. My body, I'm old, my body is littered with nucleic acids of viruses that have infected and so is everybody else is, oh, well, you know, Amy, if you're 18, you know, um, you just don't have as much as somebody who's in their late 50s. It's easy enough, I guess, to think about when it's a bacteria and they've got the DNA sitting around the cytoplasm. But it's hard for us to think about it how it's in one of our chromosomes, right? Yeah. Right, because it gets inside the nucleus. Yeah. But I guess it happens. It happens. But what about if you have COVID while you're pregnant? Is the baby's DNA still pure, or do they? Still have pure. Why? Because the, the viral DNA doesn't get into the into the placenta, into the baby. What about um, if you're vaccinated against something while you're pregnant, or the vaccines that you've had prior to getting pregnant? None of that gets transferred over. Especially since, depending on what type of vaccine you got, but especially since those are just really pieces of RNA. In the case of COVID, what you just make proteins from, and so that's not going to ever get there. There might be a little bit of antibodies that get to the baby, right? But that's not DNA. But that's not DNA, that's protein. And that, those are small enough, IgG is small enough to go through the placenta. Yes? Oh, I was just gonna say, because I remember this, and I felt like we maybe had this conversation, like natural, um, immunity versus natural immunity. Like, how do you know when you can get antibodies? Yes, not but not, DNA. it's not gonna be completely protective, and mm -hmm. that's short term because all of the antibodies are biologically active and therefore they have a half-life and so they're going to oh. denature at some point. Okay. Okay. But if you make your own antibodies, those are for a <laughs> Right, the baby gets sick, makes her, makes a, the baby makes its own antibodies, for life. Or in the same theory, if the baby has a vaccine to something. Same thing. Same thing. For life. Now, so it's a little confusing because for those of you who got COVID, they keep wanting to give you a booster, right? But the booster is doesn't mean that you don't have protection for life. The booster is just basically saying, we feel like there's a new wave coming on. We now have an updated vaccine. Take this and it's going to wake up your immune system. And if you come in contact with COVID, 
you're going to be better protected. Right? So people always say you should never take you should never take a vaccine over and over again. Mm, I, I don't know. I think I've had the um, the Prevenar vaccine eight times. They offer it to me, I take it. What? It's free. Which one's that for? Influenza. Oh, that's good. But before it was Prevenar, it was the Pneumophage, and then it was the Pneumovax, and now it's Prevenar, right? So I've had it about eight times. Yeah. How does it work when, so like when I was pregnant with my daughter, I, uh, I my midwife was going to get a PDAP. Uh -huh. How does it work when you get it and it goes through to the baby? It, the, the parts of the tetanus, pertussis, and the acellular, or tetanus, diphtheria, and the acellular pertussis detox um, that go to the baby are the antibodies, not the actual pieces that are in the vaccines. I remember she explained to me like it went through the placenta or so it somehow got to the baby, but I can't remember exactly. But remember, those aren't the baby's antibodies, so it's short term. Mm -hmm. We were just trying to make yeah. it whooping cough. A whooping cough has become a big deal. 15 years ago, whooping cough to me was a nuisance. I just like, okay, you'll be okay. But now it's killing people. So something's happened to whooping or telepertussis. Something, it's gotten stronger. Well, and people don't vaccinate as much as they used to. And the parents of the babies are the natural carriers. So then they get the baby, oh, they make Google faces with them and then they give it to the baby. Right? Yeah. I have one more question, I'm sorry. So if we compare influenza and herpes, for example. Very different. And I understand that the herpes one lies dormant. Uh -huh. but, but what is the reason why we, and I understand that you know, lying dormant means it's kind of shut off for a little bit and it comes in different times and whatnot. But why can we not fight it? Is it because there's always a little bit that lies dormant? Here's why. Because it's influenza, we get okay, right? Hold on. You can't fight herpes because herpes is a prophage in your cell. What's a prophage? It's the nucleic acid that's part of the chromosome. So if it's just part of the nucleic acid in your cell, you're never going to fight it because it's it's not it's not coming in contact with the immune system. Where influenza is in constant contact with the immune system. Unless it's inside a cell. That is a great question. I didn't know where you were going when you said herpes and blood. I'm like, those are really different. <laughs> I just try to understand. Well, the herpes has a flare up or whatnot. Essentially, it's just turned on the genes and started making more of those. When does it get flared? Well, you said when your you know, immune system's down and stressed. That's when the chicken or the egg, I don't know. But so, I don't know. <laughs> right, before, right before the big pandemic, Coachella, you know? There was a big, <laughs> there was a big outbreak of herpes in Coachella, and that was followed by a big outbreak in stagecoach, right? So for those of you hip hop and and then of course country music, right? How did they track that? Because people started showing up at the at the emergency rooms with with all these lesions on them. There was. So to me, it, it wasn't an outbreak being caused there. These were people who already had the herpes virus in them. And because they were stressed out, they were drinking alcohol, they were in the sun, they were overheated, herpes flared up. But there were thousands of people who all had outbreak, uh, who all had episodes. They called it an outbreak, but I don't think it was an outbreak like I gave it to somebody. It was an outbreak, I already had it, and everybody was stressed out and drunk at the same time that it started to show the symptoms. So you have to be careful when you say that. There's a big outbreak of cholera right now. Does anybody know where cholera is being, where's, where cholera is killing people? Haiti. Haiti. Haiti is the place, right? And the person who got on to talk about it had no idea what they were talking about. They were making mistakes left and right. So I just kind of said, man, somebody needs to school. I, what I said to my wife was like, you know, every single major news station needs to hire a microbiologist so we can get the real vernacular being used because he was he said we have an outbreak of cholera in 
Haiti. And then he said, but I don't want to call it an epidemic. I'll break equals epidemic, right? So he was contradicting himself the whole time. It drove me crazy. My <laughs> wife had to turn it off because she said, okay. I think that's a big issue with a lot of things. So many medical people watch the news to keep an eye on these things. Uh -huh. And then when you get a person on there who is ignorant to the terms and things, it just crazy. spreads fear. So, you know, one of the, one of the TV stations blocks my phone calls now. Because I used to call them all the time, you really are making a big mistake by saying that. You know, I would tell them all the time, they just block me. So now, you know, I go right to email. Well, they don't, they don't care because they, oh, they, they, never they, they, they just they get never more views back. because people are more scared. So they'll watch the news more, and then the ratings go up. So that, it's just a big cycle. The, but you're right. I think the science, a scientific person on the news that actually one knows of, this stuff. One of the good mornings has Dr. Jen on it. You know, have you seen her? She's pretty bright. And she tells it like it is. And it's interesting that Dr. Jen can talk to the everyday person. They can talk to science to the everyday person so that they can understand it. Because if you are a science person or a medical person and you talk medicine to somebody, right? Oh, your father has cardiomyopathy, and so we put them <coughs> in Trimlinburg so that they would not have any more um, edema occurring around the chest area, right? So what the hell did I just say, right? People are gonna like, what the hell did he say, right? <laughs> All I basically said is, you got swelling around the heart, we put you in, a, we put him in an inverted position so he wouldn't develop more edema, uh, more swelling around his heart. But if you talk like that, colleagues will understand each other, but the average person's not gonna understand it. You have to talk to them in their language. And that's where it's important. That's why you take a course like this, so you can understand the vernacular and you can talk to your colleagues and you can talk to physicians, but then you can also bring it back and talk to individuals who you are fostering healthcare to, educating, because you're doing all, and in some cases, giving them care. Because as a nurse, if somebody starts to have feel sad, you need to touch them. Humans want to be touched. Now that doesn't mean that Eric wants me to hug him every time I see him. But but if they're going through something, they need to have that compassion. And to me, that's what's missing. It's funny you say that. My my friend got a cosmetic surgery done, and she said that she just told me this morning that uh, the nurse that was helping her like with her through the process and stuff, got a write-up because somebody walked past the door and heard how she was talking to the patient, saying like pet names like baby or love. Or well, that's different. <laughs> but no, it was, she was consoling her because she was really nervous and scared. Yeah. And that was, I, it made her feel bad. You know. And it, they didn't like that. They said yeah. that she needed, like, basically when a patient needs consoling, she just walk out. Yeah, but you don't call them baby or things like that. I mean, but it, it helped her in the sense. I, I get it, but you know, you got. But she got in trouble for consoling the patient. That's so I, don't, you know, if you ever come to my office, I will never close the door on a person who comes to visit me, even if they're very upset. I won't close the door. It's not good for a fifty-year-old man to be in a room with a with a 20-year-old young lady, or even a 20-year-old dude, right? No. So, you know, I, I uh, like, gotta be real careful. Like, something that we learned is, like, you cannot tell people that they are going to be all right. Yeah, you, you should never do never that. You can never do that. They're gonna ask you, like, I have a patient now, I can tell y'all, because y'all don't know what's going on. He's basically immobile, he's bed-bound, he's gone stuporous. He's, like, not there, he cannot answer his name, he does not know what time it is. He does not move. He cannot turn himself. He can, yeah, he can't do anything, right? But sometimes he'll blurt something out while his wife is there. Watch, she comes and she keeps, you know, talking and he'll blurt something out. She's like, is he gonna be okay? I can't say that. Look, the correct answer is we all hope for a positive outcome. Because yeah. you, you can't, can't make that, promises. You can't make promises because they can look, he come back around and be like, oh, you said he'd be okay. Well, now I'm gonna sue you because he said he'd be okay and he's not. 
So Unfortunately, you have to be careful. It's, that's, that's, that's it's really like that. Like you can't tell people that they'll be all right, even if they look like they're getting better. You can't tell them that. A doctor can't say that. Oh, you'll be fine. Like you can't even say that. So it's it's like a touch and go kind of thing. Like because I have to console a lot of my patients. They have dementia. They're lost. They don't know what they're doing. And I just have to say, hey. With dementia patients, with you almost have to console the family. Yeah. Because nobody really knows what's going on. Lysogeny, tell me what that means, Samantha. Not well, so that's what I was trying to read just okay. now. I don't understand. Lysogeny, tell me what that means, Eric. The nucleic acid of the virus gets into the cell and it goes dormant. Yes. And every single cell that comes after that particular parent cell is going to have that profage in it. That's why she asked that question. I wish they'd use a different okay. word, because when I hear lice, I'm thinking it's going to rupture. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I can clearly see that it's not rupturing. Right. Can you say it the way you said it a little bit slower? The nucleic. How about if I do it this way? When 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 a virus infects a cell, in some cases, the nucleic acid becomes part of the of the genome and it goes dormant. Okay? And then every cell that is formed from that parent cell that's been infected whether it's through binary fission or through mitosis, will carry that particular viral nucleic acid. So you can have thousands, hundreds of thousands of cells that all have these. And they can activate. And then they get activated, and then you get the symptom. Is that also with chickenpox? Chickenpox, shingles, shingles later. Shingles Those are the two more common ones, mm -hmm. okay? So a, lot of, a lot of scientists believe that multiple sclerosis is a viral process. I can't jump on that bandwagon just yet because I haven't seen enough data that says that. Do you think that somebody can get shingles without having chickenpox? No, they've had to. They must have had chickenpox at some point. I've heard it. Yeah. I've heard that all, you know, my life. Or it's a new infection, and instead of showing the pox, you get the shingles. Mm -hmm. I sound like my. I sound like my aunt. I didn't, I never got the pox, I got the shingles. I'm like, okay, that's the same thing. Okay, fine. Isn't that inevitable that everyone gets chicken pox if they go to a public school system? Not or? really. My I cousins never, never got it. I've never had chicken pox. So you I should get the, if you've never had chicken pox, you should take the chicken pox vaccine. I think it's at a time too. I think it's required that, for nursing school, right? It's, well, it's required at school now. Like in like lower well, you know. I don't know. You're right, because they do ask you, like, have you had it? There's a list. I don't, I don't know. Know. They, they, they don't really apply. Yeah, they actually know. have to have the immunization done. Like, no sense yeah, yeah. There yeah. should be, look, there should be no waivers for vaccines for health care. I agree, but yet there are. They're wandering it's around. It's all religious practices. Like, then go do something else. That's, well, that's how they get around it. They no. say re it's religious. So that's why they don't have me as administrator, because I said they go help to go do something else. If you don't want to follow the rules, you don't want to protect our patients, go do something else. Well, you know how scary it is with kids in the, in the like public school system now? Because a parent can say, oh, my kid's not vaccinated because for religious reasons. But yet my child has to go to school with that child and can get me. Well, I, I live... Mm -hmm. I live in a hot spot. I always tell my wife, I'm like, that school is going to be the death of us. Because I live in an area where there is a school that 80% of the kids that go there are unvaccinated. How do you know that? It's Statistics. Public it's public. It's scary. It didn't tell you which ones, but it's 80%, right? I know, like. So if there's a major outbreak and they all get it, guess what's going to come to my neighborhood? Well, like two or three years ago, there was that ma major like measles outbreak. My daughter was a baby, and it's it terrified me because they said that the rate of children getting vaccinated in Texas alone was down so much. And I was like, why? <laughs> I don't understand. Yep. All right, let's talk about cytopathic effect. Cytopathic effect when cells get infected by a virus, they all will change these cells that they're infecting. Now, I'm not going to expect you to know every single cytopathic effect, but I expect you to know that cytopathic effects are associated with viruses, right? And it just changes the cell. Now, those changes can be, for instance, they can round up the cell, they can make them look clumpy, and there's all kinds of different things. Right? I'm expecting to know every single one. 
but I do want you to know what cytotoxic effect is, CPE. Okay? Can it only That's, the morphology? It can also be inclusions. Okay. Okay? So that's why we look at dysplastic cells with, we talked about the pap smear. The reason we can look at those and they look different is because when the virus is infected, they change the cells. Okay? So we'll talk, let's talk about influenza and then we're gonna stop for the day. So in, to me, influenza is the most important pathogen in our lives. And people are not afraid of it. Say that again? Influenza is the most important pathogen in our lives. And people are not afraid of it, right? Roughly 30% of the population gets the flu vaccine. Yep. Do you think coronavirus will become the same way? I am, I am very optimistic of coronavirus because if you look at the numbers right now, uh, very few people are getting infected, and those that are getting infected, very few of them are getting really serious on this. I think the United States has gotten to a point where we have gotten to herd immunity, but nobody wants to say that because if they say that, then people will, be, will stop, stop practicing good practices, right? I get it, but to me, I, I believe, I'm going on the record, that I believe we've gotten to herd immunity. I carry masks in my vehicles, I have them at home, I have them in my satchel, and I took them with me. Mask? Mask, yeah. Okay. I took them with me this weekend mm -hmm. when I visited my family. And when I went to visit my elderly family, I wore a mask, and then they all told me, take your mask off, right? So if they wanted me to take it off, I took it off. But they're elderly, they're in their late 80s and 90s, I wanted to protect them. Okay. When you wear a mask, what the reason you wear a mask is not to protect you, you can't. The viruses are too small. They're gonna get in. Now with the N95, that's different. An N95 has got a static charge in it. So when the virus gets in there, it gets caught in that charge. And so therefore, N95s work really great. You can never get an N95 wet, or you should never wash it. it it's dirty, you leave it like that, okay? Do not clean it without. You can sanitize it with UV if you want, that'll be okay. But you do not get it wet, because it'll destroy it. But, um, um, so I'll, I'll wear a mask when I need to. I don't really feel like I need to know to wear a mask. Well, if I feel sick, I will. But, you know, I am quadruple vaccinated. I, I'm protected. Um, and so COVID was going around two weeks ago, and I was like, oh, here it comes again. And, but for some reason, it, it had me, I mean, I had two <coughs> students in my other classes that had COVID. One of them got it really bad. She was out for a while, right? And she decided to drop the class because she was really But that being said, it, it just isn't as prevalent as it was, right? The, um, Travis County and the city of Austin have stopped tracking it because it's just not in the numbers that it was. And at okay. hospitals, apparently, you can they just changed it that you have the option to not wear a mask. Mm -hmm. I was as like, a like it, it, it's like, not, you don't care. Yeah. I've yeah. seen nurses go yeah. around and doctors too. I had read my mother in law is a big I'll show you too. I'm very interested in that. I wasn't sure if type O blood is protective. See, my husband has O here. He's protective. But my mother, he has O positive. My mother in law has O negative, and she has never gotten it. I'll show you the statistics in a little bit. She's one of those ones. So, influenza is a killer, right? And so, the every hundred years, about, we get a major pandemic, right? The last time we got a major pandemic was Spanish flu of 1918 over 30 million people, now that's being conservative, more than that, over 30 million people died worldwide. How many people have died from COVID? Million. I think it's two million now, or something like that. 
That's still a lot of lives. Best document, probably more. Yeah. But it's a lot less because we have more of a population now. That's interesting, right? Because we have a whole lot more people. Why didn't we have a lot more deaths? Well, I, I'm going to tell you this. COVID-19 was a whimper. It is not a major pandemic. It is a warning of things to come. We have way better medicine to deal with in 1918. That is correct also. Yeah. Even though at the time it hit, we didn't have it. Yeah. Right? So if we think about this, this is kind of, if you ever go Spanish flu, look it up, uh, you'll, you'll get completely, you'll be completely in awe of the microbes because they rule. You cannot stop them. So, I mean, entire gymnasiums become triage centers. You know what I mean by that? Oh, wow, that looks like this person's really sick. Let's put them over here. They might survive. Then this, you're thinking about this to themselves. Oh, this person, oh my God, they're not gonna make it. Let's put them over there. Give them a little palliative care, check on their own so they're gonna die. And then, oh, here's a young person. And the young person looks like they're really sick, but they're young. There's a good chance they're gonna survive. Let's put our resources into them. That's what triage is, okay? You have to make decisions when you have that. So think about this, right? People in other countries, when they had so many cases of COVID, they were burning bodies to get rid of them because they had no other way to get rid of them. Brazil took a different approach. They just got in there, they dug a deep hole with a tractor, and then they just mass buried everybody because they had to stop the spread. And in those days, we didn't know how to spread. We thought it was respiratory, but we didn't know for sure. Those co other countries, in order to protect their populations, they did what they had to do. Okay? That's what's going to happen if, if the organism that I think is going to cause problems ever shows up. Right? So in 2009, we had a <laughs> pandemic, swine flu, right? Now, this is the way it happens, right? So when there's mixing of animals, right? Let's keep little kids just having fun. Give a little oh kissy pee pig, right? But that's the way it happens. No, it doesn't have to be like that. It can be that you're working with a bunch of chickens on a farm. And that's the way it can spread, right? That's the way it can mix, right? So in 2009, we had an, an epidemic, oh, a pandemic, right? Pandemic is all continents except Antarctica because there's not many people there. But swine flu hit. Now, swine flu killed people. But it was only about 0.1% of the entire population that got swine flu that died. And the people who died already had some other comorbidity, right? Because that's nature's way. Nature's way takes a week, okay? That's the way it works. Now, people get mad when I say that, but that's the truth, okay? Everything in the world is food for something else, okay? So here we are, right? The reason it was called swine flu is there was a mixing, and the, there was mixing, there was one, there was one that is endemic in humans, one that was endemic in birds, and two that were endemic in pigs. <laughs> swine, the pigs win, swine flu, right? We had vaccinations for it, but it never really caused the amount of cases we thought it was gonna cause. There was a lot of cases, but not very many. People died, but not many. This was not a major pandemic, as COVID was not. Now, people will argue and say it was a major pandemic. It just didn't kill the population that it should have if it was a major pandemic. There's one out there that's bad. So here's H1N1, that's swine flu. You can see that it's easily spread, but it's rarely fatal. Right? Kill 0.1% of the population that infected. This thing, H5N1, is a monster. It is a killer. The good thing is right now it doesn't spread very easily. But when it does get into you, 60% of the people who come in contact with it will die. How did this one spread? Huh? How did this one spread? Right now, just from coming in contact with birds. This is the very one you spoke about at the beginning of This is the bad boy. Yes. This just cements everything. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it is here in the States. It is in other places, right? But, um, but it just hasn't been easily spread, right? It's about a mutation or two away from being easily spread. If this happens, we're going to be in a major problem. Because you think 
and you think we were ready or we're not ready for COVID, we're not going to be ready for this thing. It's going to cause a lot of death. So take, let's just take the United States, 328 million Americans, one million of those, how many people are going to die? 600,000. Multiply that by, three, by 328. And you see the problem. If you think that our healthcare system was overtaxed and overburdened by COVID, wait till this thing comes. So how do we prepare? We can get a vaccine, but we haven't got one yet because all the research has gone into COVID. I do have a little place in, in Bastrop. If this thing happens, come there, bring a skill. A skill. Do not show up and say, hi, Pro V. Remember me, Jin Jin? I'm really cute. Take me in. No. I'm a nurse. Okay, good. Come on in. Okay. Right? Bring, grow something, hunt something, cook something, okay. sew something, build something. Welcome in. My dog kills stuff. No, no, no. No dog? No. Because no. it might become food. Oh. Right? <laughs> when we are in that process, we will eat. Now, I will tell you that my one of my family members on the other side of, the, of the, my wife's side is a prepper, and that particular person has got two-year supply of food. We will be visiting her yeah. as a cohort. Yeah. Now, she will probably shoot us, so we might have to take her down in order to get the food. And I don't have a problem doing that, okay? But we'll at least have a chance. Yeah, there's yeah. more of us in there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I say this in jest, but I want you but you're to. You're being under, serious. I, if it happens, this thing is a bad boy. And if you don't believe me, you can look it up. As a matter of fact, anything I ever say in here, you have the opportunity to do your own research, and you can basically come back and say, "Probably you were wrong," and I will say, "Okay, tell me why." But I'm not wrong. I've warned a couple of people about this since you talked about it at the very beginning. But then I don't know what to say when they ask me questions, so I need to do more. So with that outbreak, <laughs> the previous one, H5N1, did it just fizzle out? It just fizzled out. Just fizzled out. So are the strains We're still in the birds right now? No, it's still in the human population. You know, we still have swine flu in the human population. The avian flu. No, avian flu is still around. It's only in birds right now. If, if, a patient get, if, a, if a person gets it, Sometimes they survive, many times they don't. Right. But when they convalesce, they're a little bit better for it because they have immunity to it. Right. Where we don't, I don't. Right. So H1N1 is what? H5N1 is what? That's the bad boy. It that is the bad boy. We don't know if it doesn't hide in the human genome or anything and then come back out again later, right? Nope. It's a flash in the pan and it's Check it out. If you want to be scared, look it up. Oh, I have. <laughs> <laughs> and I've spread it too. So I, I am not afraid. I'm a microbiologist. I understand it. There's nothing you can do about it. Why be afraid? If it comes, you'll deal with it. Right? But remember, we are United States citizens. And by definition, United States citizens are proud and we don't want to be told what to do so if this virus shows up and we tell you because we don't say stay we we're not like president chi in china you will stay home i want to go out i don't care what you think you stay home right if we say we in the united states we won't say stay home we'll say please stay home but we don't make you stay home So you can do whatever you want. You're American. Americans, by definition, are selfish. Mm -hmm. We're going to do whatever the hell we want. And don't tell me what to do. I'm OK with that. But take it back a little bit and remember that when we say, please stay home, we're not just trying to protect you. We're trying to protect the entire population also. Because Again, Mother Nature is creative and she is an assassin. And what she wants is the weak, the old, and the young. Because the weak can't handle it, the old it's time, and the young they can't handle it either. They don't have an immune system. 
flu? Avian flu is going to be different. Avian flu will not care about age. Because I know the COVID and it's going to kill everybody. Didn't hurt kids yeah. very much. At all. No, no, because kids are resilient. And all they have is a white blood cell. And it is it is dramatic to watch a kiddo go through an infection. Their segs and bands go way up, their white blood cells go way up, and they get through things, usually. I know my daughter wasn't affected when we had it at all. Well, that's because she has attitude, and you know, nothing's gonna bother her. <laughs> I met that little thing, right? She wouldn't even She's look Emma. at me. Yeah, she wouldn't even look at me. I would talk to her and she would go look at mama. She showed me her boot. <laughs> this is all you're gonna get. <laughs> yeah. Ladies and gentle dudes, we're gonna stop.